All right, good morning, you guys. How are you doing? Let's turn on the power there. All right, good morning, guys. How's everybody doing? All right. So for those of you in here that are fathers, the handful of you, and for those of you that might join online that are fathers, we want to wish you all a happy Father's Day. Yes. It is a, you know, I was telling Margaret earlier, I'm not a big fan of holidays. Just not, never will be. You know, the way I see it is we should be good fathers every day of the year. Fathers should be celebrated every day. Mothers should be celebrated every day. People should be celebrated every day because that's just, well, that's a good way to live life. That's just my opinion. But nationally, we take this day and we say thank you, dads, because dads are important. You know, this wasn't in my teaching or anything, but I just want to throw it out there. A father being the father of a household the way God intended is one of the most critical aspects of a family. Most people do not realize how big of a deal it is. I've heard these statistics. I'm going to kind of mar them a little bit because I didn't write them down. Like I said, I didn't plan this. But I remember learning. In a household where a father or a mother, neither of them serve Christ, the chances of a child coming to the Lord are like 23%. Just statistically, something around that. And if the mother serves the Lord, those chances double, maybe triple to the 40s to 60s percent. But I've heard a statistic that says when a father faithfully serves the Lord, faithfully, and is a man of God, it's like a 93 percent chance that the whole household will follow out and root and serve God. And the kids may go astray, as you know, your daughter went crazy for a few years. Your son, I'm sure, went crazy. The other daughter went crazy, as my mother-in-law says. All teenagers get weird, you know, and we do. But my wife is probably the strongest believer I've ever met. And I know John is definitely on his way to being a strong believer. I know where he's at as far as he's grounded. may not be where he needs to be, but he's grounded. And Rachel, the, my sister-in-law, she's going to be grounded because my father-in-law served the Lord. And you dads, if you serve the Lord, if you are faithful to God, Realize the impact that that has not only on your household, but on society. Today, that is our biggest deficit is fatherless homes. Or even worse, homes that have fathers and the fathers don't care. So to the dads that care and give two cares and they are there for their family, thank you fathers because you guys really are the backbone to the family. You're the backbone to the church. Thank you guys. So, happy Father's Day. Now, you can turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The door is propped open. Are you? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, okay. My wife texted me something, but I missed it. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for being God, and we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, for this beautiful morning. Again, we thank you for the fathers, Lord, that you've raised up, that you are continuing to raise up as you continue to to do a work in each of us, Lord. Would Would we be faithful men after your own heart to love you and to serve you with all of our heart, mind, soul, with all of our strength? Lord, would we truly be yours and would you be ours? Would we lead our children and our wives and would we be leaders in our communities and in our churches, Lord? We thank you for just being so good. We thank you for this morning as we get into your word. Would you be our teacher, Abba? Would you be the one who speaks through me? Get me out of the way, Father, and just have your way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What are you going to say, babe? Huh? Hold on, my wife has something she wants to tell me, so I'm not sure what it is. Rita's outside. She's wondering where it was. Oh. Go, go grab her, babe. All right. First Corinthians chapter... 12. Last week as we started in chapter 12, good morning, Teresa. Last week as we started in chapter 12, we saw that the church was having issues. And the issues were with spiritual gifts. We saw that one of the bigger issues amongst the gifts was the gift of tongues. And we kind of went over it lightly and we're going to cover it more in depth as we go forward in the next two chapters. But how the Corinthians had this emphasis on tongues. And, you know, it's one of the major issues in the church today is tongues. It's one of those gifts that we see, we hear, we don't quite understand. It's okay to not understand, but that we abuse. And when I say abuse, what I mean is we don't do it according to the Word of God. We don't do it the way God prescribes it to be done. 
And when we do things contrary to what the Bible teaches, we're now in something else other than what God has given us. You might be operating in a gift, so to speak, but if it's the abuse of a gift, it's no good. Good morning, Rita. And if it's the abuse of a gift, then it's no good. It's like anything. You know, everything has its place. Everything is good. But when we take it out of the context that it was designed to be, it becomes worthless. It becomes something else other than its intention. I always use a phone because I just, you know, we all have phones. If there's somebody who doesn't have a phone, then they're just stoic and archaic. They're old. You know, even old people have phones, though. But if you were to get a flat on the side of the road, you would never go to your lug nuts on your tire and start smacking the lug nuts with your phone trying to get the lug nuts off. It's just something you wouldn't do. And the reason you wouldn't do it is because the phone wasn't designed for that. It'll never take the lug. You can smack it as hard as you like, and all you're going to end up with is a broken phone. But you can take a crossbar, and you can pull the lug nuts off with a crossbar. Or you know, if your vehicle comes with a little tool to take them off, then that's what it was created. It'll take it off. If you don't have one, then you can take your phone. Don't slam it into your rim, because you'll break it. You can call AAA or you can call a family member to come get you and then the phone has served its purpose or the crossbar has served its purpose. But everything that works the way it was according and designed to work works beautifully, it's wonderfully. It's meant to be a help and it's meant to do great things. Well, the gift of tongues is like that. It's meant to edify, it's meant to build up. It's meant to be great in the church. Yes, 1 Corinthians 12. We'll be in verses 12 to the end of the chapter. But it's meant to build up. It's a gift given by God. But when we take that gift and we operate in discord with that gift, I should say in con contrast to what God says it should be done, it no longer becomes edifying. Let me give you an example. You guys, has anybody ever been in a church where, you know, tongues becomes the focal point of the service? It's usually middle to the end of the service, and you get 30, 40, 50, 60 people. They all come up to the front, and everybody's, blah, 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 and they're all doing their thing, and whatever, like, you know. And then they start getting real emotional. They start falling down or throwing up, and, you know, the pastor starts running back and forth, takes off his jacket, swings it around. I mean, this is real stuff. This is real. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. It's real. And it turns into a circus. Now, what's the issue with that? Why is that bad? Because what you're no longer doing is you're no longer worshiping Jesus. It's no longer about the Lord. And you, they all claim, well, but it's the Spirit of God. He's present. He's... The Spirit of God will never do anything that takes glory away from Jesus, ever. As a matter of fact, Jesus, speaking of the Spirit, said, when he comes, he's going to testify of me. He's not going to testify of himself. The Spirit's not going to come to make a spectacle of himself. The Spirit's going to come to put Jesus on high. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to draw us to Christ. That is why to blaspheme the Spirit, to blaspheme His ministry, is to reject Christ. You have now, if you, reject, if you die rejecting Christ, you have now completely blasphemed the Spirit's job. Because His job is to testify of Jesus. His job is to, so He says that He's going to come, He's going to lead the world, in a, not lead them, convict the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. That's what He does. He draws us to the Lord. He doesn't draw us to himself because the Spirit didn't come to put himself on display. And when you see the people and they get up and they become the spectacle, that's what they do. They put the Spirit of God on display. That was happening in Corinth. And last week we saw that the Corinthians believed if you didn't have the manifestation of tongues, you weren't saved. If you didn't have the manif and I say it like that for this reason, because they believed if you didn't have the manifestation of tongues, the Spirit of God didn't indwell you. And the indwelling of the Spirit, we're going to see that today, and the speaking of tongues, they made that a synonymous thing. Well, the indwelling of the Spirit and salvation are a synonymous thing, right? Everyone in here, at some point, we all gave our lives to Christ. Is that correct? Right. Or is there somebody in here that may not be a believer? Okay, we're all believers. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says something happens. We are sealed with the Spirit of promise. This change takes place within us. Now, there is a point where the Spirit comes in power. That's when gifts are operated. So when they spoke in tongues and acts and two or three different accounts, the Spirit came upon them in power. And therein, there was a purpose for that. It wasn't just so they could speak in tongues. It was to draw people in. Remember in the book of Acts, what is it, chapter, whatever, five, I think, the Pentecost. When Pentecost happens and they all start speaking in tongues in the upper room. Do you remember what happens? 
all these thousands of people that are there for the feast, they hear this and they're like, these are Galilean. We can hear their accent. They're not from our country, but they're speaking our language. They shouldn't know this. They, how do they understand this? And they're, they're all baffled. And Peter comes out and gives his message. And it says 3,000 came to the faith that day. When tongues are present and accompanied, it, it can be an evidence that the Spirit of God is moving. Absolutely. Or it can be the evidence that we're manipulating a gift in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you how that gift is manipulated. It happened to me once. They walk up and they start knocking your dog. Just start, blah, 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 and then just start. You smack me again, I'm going to smack you back. <laughs> you know, like, get your hand off my chin. If God has given me the gift of tongues, I will speak in tongues. You can't force the manifestation of a gift. We saw last week in verse 11, remember what it says? But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing each to each one individually just as He wills. That means I can't will a gift onto myself. I can't just decide I'm going to be a Bible teacher. I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm going to be a speaker of tongues. I'm going to be... God gives each of you and myself. He's given us, given us gifts according to His will. Now, we can pray for the gifts. We can pray for a certain gift. I used to pray to be a worship leader. I thought worship leading was like the bomb. If I sing to you guys, you would leave. Because I do not have a gift to, to worship in that matter. It's what it is. It's okay. It's not a bad thing. It's just what it is. God called me to be a Bible teacher. That's what I am. When I teach the Word of God, the Spirit of God moves in a unique way where, as I love how, what Trish says, you know, when I'm not teaching, I'm a little turd. <laughs> I love it. It's okay. It's our relationship. It's, don't feel bad. It's just, but that's what it is. And I'm 100% in agreement because you know, I know me. But she said, when I sit up here and I start teaching, an authority takes place, and it's like, it's not me anymore. Now, as far as I'm concerned, nothing's changed from where I'm sitting. But there is a presence that God brings about when I teach, because it's the gift he's given that an authority takes place, and that's just what it is, because he's gifted me in this area. So, I don't know why, I kind of went off on a little tangent there, I went further than I was supposed to, but... That was taking place in Corinth. And these who weren't speaking in tongues were being demeaned because they lacked certain gifts. And it appears that their lack of these certain gifts, tongues in particular, it was used as a testimony against them that they had not received the Spirit of God. Hence, last week, Paul kept saying, this gift, one Spirit. This gift, one Spirit. This gift, the same Spirit. This gift, this, this, gift. It's all in the same Spirit. He makes this point. The Spirit of God doesn't just accompany tongues, but it accompanies every gift that is given because they are all given by Him. All of them. There is a place for tongues, and it's to be done in order. We'll see that later, but not right now. So again, verse 1 through 11, Paul makes the point as he lists off the number of gifts that each gift, although distinct, is powered, empowered by the Holy Spirit. They're all His. And as each gift operates, that's an evidence of the Spirit of God at work in that believer's life. So it's not like if you speak in tongues, you're more spiritual. You have a better relationship with the Lord. The Spirit of God uses you more mightily. It means nothing. And, it does, and if you have the gift of hospitality, Trish has that gift. She's just, she has the gift to be hospitable in a way that I don't. And it's okay. And God uses that gift in her and it edifies and draws. I mean, this little church is a product of the hospitality of Trish. No Trish, Expound wouldn't be here today. You guys would all be somewhere else. And so God used that gift, which we may call it insignificant. God says it's very significant. And watch what I'm gonna do through that. This today, as we go forward, Paul is gonna stress the unity of the body. Again, the last thing we ever wanna do is look at somebody and say, because you don't have such, such and such, you're not a part of us. In the Christian faith, there is a time to distinguish ourselves and to remove ourselves. There is. You know, I wish we could just say, like, oh, there should never be division and so and so, and but there is a time for division. You know, when we deal with the essentials of our faith, that those are points of division, and I would heartily agree. I'll give you a quick example. I'll just list off the five essentials of our faith that Christians ought to divide over the person or, or the nature of God. The person and work of Christ, the vicarious atonement, 
the bodily resurrection, and the second coming literally. Those five aspects of our faith, we could spend an entire teaching just studying those. We're not going to, but those five aspects are something we ought to divide over. I'll give me an example. When people say God is only love and God is nothing else, and then they refuse to acknowledge God and His true nature, that may be a point of division. Where I'll, I would say, you're not us and we're not you. Uh, maybe you're born again, maybe you're not. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step over here because you and I do not see, I, uh, you know, God is more than just love. You know, when we just attribute love to God, we just totally remove his holiness. We totally, in the homosexual movement, that's what it's all about, right? Love is love is love is love is love is love is love isn't just love. God is love. And what accompanies that love is the holiness of God. And the reverence that follows that holiness and the obedience that follows because of that holiness. And it comes all this other stuff that comes into that. But the nature of God, what and who he is, the person and work of Christ, Jesus is God. When somebody of, the, of, of, a, of another denomination or religion comes and says, Jesus never claimed to be God, we draw a line between us and we say, all right, look, you're something else, we're something else. And they'll say, no, 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 we're all the same. We're not the same. The Bible is very distinct and clear that Jesus is God. You can find it from New Testament back to the Old Testament, all the way back to the New Testament, all over. Jesus consistently claims to be God. The Old Testament prophets declare him to be God. I see a little confusion. You can talk to me afterwards. But as we've been in the book of Revelation in the first five chapters, we've seen probably 40 references to the deity of Christ. You guys have sat with me through this. I mean, at least 40 references. Probably about 20 of those in the first chapter. So when somebody says Jesus isn't God, we draw a line and say, whoa, then you don't believe the same God that we believe in because the Bible teaches that Jesus is God. Well, the Old Testament does it. Micah 5, 2, his going forth start from eternity. Only God is eternal. Puts a wrench in your socket right there. Psh, you're done. Man. What do you do with that? The vicarious atonement, Jesus dying for our sins. He took our sin on his body. If somebody were to say they're a Christian but they don't believe that, I mean, that's why we're Christians, right? Because of, we've been forgiven. You know, to deny the, 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 the death of Christ, his vicarious atonement, his taking our sin on his body. It's what about Isaiah 53 is all about. You can go read that at face value, and it's about that. The bodily resurrection. There are those, there are Christians who don't believe Jesus really raised from the dead. I would have to say then you're probably not a Christian. You can call yourself a Christian. You're just not a Christian. Well, how dare you say, dude, the Bible's very clear that the Messiah would not decay, Old Testament. New Testament, he rose. Paul says he was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses, many of which are still alive today, as if to say, go question them. So mass delusion doesn't work because mass delusion is impossible. It's, even if they were to roofie everybody or give them some kind of psychedelic drug, nobody, it's impossible that people have the same vision. It's impossible. If everybody here took some psychedelic drug, nobody would have the same trip. We would all see different things. And So when 500 people see this risen Messiah, that puts a wrench in that theory. And the second coming literally. He will literally come back. And I mean, that's there's more verses about his second coming than his first coming. Literally, physically. Now I mentioned those five for this reason because the Bible is very black and white on those things. Therefore, those are things we're willing to divide over. Now, we don't have to be nasty in a division. We just say, okay, you're not us, we're not you. It doesn't mean we can't be friends with them. It doesn't mean we still can't have heart, hearty debates. We just make a, a recognition, we're different. And you don't believe in the same God we believe in. You might say you do, but you don't. Why? Because if you believe in the same God I believe in, the Bible's very clear on these subjects. And the rest of everything else is not worth dividing over. It's just not. We're going to get into the unity of the believers in this chapter. And the unity is more important than, the, than the, the, the division in this subject. The last thing that we want to do is divide because Trish doesn't have the same gift I have. And, and I can't believe you don't speak in tongues. And I can't believe you don't teach. And I can't believe you don't evangelize. Oh, I can't believe you're not hospitable. And the body's like that, though. You'd be shocked. How when people don't operate the way we think they should, 
we want to just divide over it. And Paul's going to make a clear cut case. Don't do that because it's one and the same spirit at work within the body. Difference is okay. So we start off in verse 12 and he says, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, what Paul is doing here is he's establishing what's called compound unity. Compound unity is the multitude make the one. The multitude make the one. And he's going to go off here in a moment, and he's going to actually use a body to give this illustration. We think of our body, and you know, we have all these uh, you know, little phalanges and legs and toes and ankles and ears and, you know, fuzz on the knuckle and fuzz in the ear and nose hair and we have pores and hair. I mean, you can just list through the body. And there's, I mean, you start getting to the molecular level. There is so much going on. I mean, scientists don't even have it all figured out yet. There's so much going on with the body. And we're going to find that every little piece of the body, though distinct, makes the body what it is. That's going to be Paul's moment here. That's the church. Although the church makes, it's made up of millions upon millions, maybe more, of believers, we are unified in one spirit. We are unified in one Messiah. We are one body. Verse 13, let's go with verse 12 again. I'll read through verse 13. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one Spirit. The unity. Now, you know, as we're going through this chapter, it's kind of odd. You know, when I was getting ready to study 1 Corinthians 12, my initial idea was we're going to go through the gifts. Yay, gifts, 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 gifts. And as I've studied this chapter, what I have found is 1 Corinthians 12, though it lists the gifts, it's not really about the gifts. It's about the unity of the believers. The gifts are mentioned because the gifts became a point of contention. The gifts became the point of division. And Paul wants to make the point that we should not divide over such petty matters. That's, we want to keep that in mind as we go through this because we're going to get into 13 next week, the better way. Then we'll get into 14 where we get into the gifts again in a more probably in-depth way as we get into that. But what I don't want to do because every teaching I think I've ever heard on this, the gifts are always the stress of the teaching. And that is not the stress of this chapter. They're mentioned, but the stress of the chapter is the unity within the belief, body of believers. Do you know how much more unified do you know the biggest problem with the church today is our disunity is we don't work together we work against each other did you know that's one of the reasons that believers refuse to come they look at the church and i mean we're we're i mean we're a circus sometimes and it's true because rather than working together rather, rather than getting over our petty differences we don't we we stand up opposed to each other and why do we do that and it's usually petty matters again what's a good reason for the church to divide over essential matters over essential matters when it's a petty matter let it go it might bug you i mean i love my bride so much you guys will never know but sometimes she does things that bother the living daylights out of me you know, and it's because she's a human. And sometimes I'll even talk to her about it. And then she'll still do it. Because she's still a human. She's a sinner. I mean, I mean I'm, likewise, I do things that bug the daylights out of her too. It's just, it's part of the human nature. If you've been married, you know it. You've been there, you feel it. You still probably deal with it. And every time my wife does something that bothers me, and I'm like, talk to her about this. Ah! My, 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 my person wants to do one of two things. The first thing is the fleshly thing. I'm, I want to make a big deal out of this. Let's gal and let's make a big old hoopla and let's, ah, maybe she'll never do it again because of the fight. Or I can let it go. I've learned to let things go. Because it's not important. It's not essential. So, I mean, all right, you know what? 
she doesn't rinse off the dish, I'll go rinse the dish off when she puts it in the sink. That's what is seriously a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> it's like, it's a huge pet peeve. And my grandma, she instilled that in me as a kid. Just rinse it off and when we wash it later, it's an easy wash. But if you let like ketchup and eggs dry on a plate, it is hard to get it off later. You just four second rinse and that saves you all kinds of trouble. So I've learned instead of getting upset, I'll go rinse it off. Or if I miss it and I don't get to, I'll just wash the dish, I'll scrub it off, I'll just, and I'll, it's all right. It's not worth fighting over. It's not worth making a division in my household over it. That's a petty division. That's a petty division. But the church needs to learn to act like that also. Because we divide over things that aren't worth dividing over. Doesn't mean you have to be buddy-buddy. Doesn't mean you have to go to this or that fellowship. But it means make sure in your heart there's not a division there. Because we, if they are believers, are going to have to spend eternity with them. <laughs> How fun is that? There's other Christians that I'm not too fond of. But I'm not going to let it get to me because I know that one day I'm going to have to live with them forever. Forever. Unless I don't want to go to heaven, but I'm not trying to make that happen. So we get over the petty difference. The unity of the believers. Verse 13, he says something interesting here. He says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Now, baptism, this isn't really, you know, stressing baptism, but I want to mention what baptism is because it's important for us to understand what baptism is and why this word is used. Now, the act of baptizing was a common thing in this day. I mean, people would baptize often, but the actual word baptism, it, it, it's the Greek word baptizo, and it, the root is bapto. And the clearest example that I've ever found of it came from a Greek poet. He was a physician named Nicanander who lived about 200 BC. Listen to what he says. He says, it is a recipe for making pickle. Let me, I'm going to read it from here. Nicanander, who lived in 200 BC, says it's a recipe for making pickles and is helpful because it, is bo it uses both words. Nicanander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable should first be dipped, bapto, into boiling water and then baptized, baptizo, into the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of vegetables in a solution. But the first is temporary. The second is the act of baptizing the vegetable, which produces a permanent change. When you gave your life to Christ, you were baptized in the Spirit. He sealed you and a permanent change took place. The baptism of the Spirit isn't when the Spirit comes upon you and blah, 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 blah. The baptism of the Spirit is synonymous with salvation. When the Spirit of God seals you and a permanent change takes place. Can you guys remember when that happened in your lives? Most of us can because usually it's somewhat of a dramatic experience. Maybe not like hi-fi dramatic, but it's a noticeable thing that takes place in you. I remember that day I gave my life to Christ and things were just different after that. Does mo most of us probably remember that? That's really what the baptism of the Spirit is when this permanent change takes place. And then there's this baptizing of the Spirit that we think of when the Spirit comes upon us mightily. I wouldn't so much call that the baptism. That's just the power of the Spirit. That's what that is. Eh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not. But there are those who do believe that in order to be baptized in the Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. There are many churches that believe that. My problem with that is, Paul says that not everybody speaks in tongues. And that, if that's the case, then how do we deal with that? How do we come to a conclusion with that? I mean, so does that mean that everybody else who believes we're not really believers? Or we are believers, but we're like half-breed believers? Again, the point is the unity of the Spirit. The same Spirit that gives the tongue is the same Spirit that gives the wisdom, is the same Spirit that gives the knowledge, is the same Spirit that gives the gift to teach. It's the conversion that takes place, kind of like that vegetable when it's baptized, the literal meaning of it's being baptized, it makes a permanent change in that vegetable. When you were sealed with the Spirit of God, a permanent change took place in you. That's why sometimes it's important to have the mind, actually let me rephrase that, it's always important to have the mindset of the original time frame of the rioters so that we have an idea of what's going on. Because if we were to just take baptism for what we understand it, we just believe it, dunk them. Boop, boop, boop. 
I mean, when I was, I was born a Catholic, that's, that's what we believed as Catholics. You just get dunked or sometimes just sprayed with a little water and you're good for life. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. You know, you're, there's no change if you're just dunked in water. The change takes place when the Spirit of God seals you. But again, the stress here isn't baptism, but unity. There is a flaw in humanity. And the flaw in humanity is we like to put judgments to what we can see. We like to put judgments to things that make us feel. When we think of tongues, one of the things that it does, it does one of two things in a believer. One of three things. The first thing is it freaks them out. First time I experienced tongues in a church it kind of freaked me out. It's probably because of the way it was done. The other thing that it does is it hypes. Either you get raptured into it, you get all caught up into it, and you run with it, and you just have this religious experience. Not that it's really a spiritual deal, but it's just a, an experience, and you just get caught up with emotion. It's kind of like a concert. They have hype men, and the whole idea of the hype man is to get you excited, and it's easy to get caught up in the excitement of people running around and acting a fool. Then. And then the other thing that it does is it puts a burning anger in believers. I'm the last one in that. When I go to churches and I see it happening, I really get frustrated. And it angers me. Not that the people are doing it, but it angers me that the leadership allows the things to take place. That the leadership would allow the, the Spirit of God to be mocked in such a way. Well, how could I say that? Why would I say that I get angered over that? Because the Bible says that when tongues are spoken, there should be an interpreter present. And when tongues are spoken, it should be done in order, and one person at a time should speak as one interprets, and the whole purpose should be for the edification of the body. And so when I get angry, it's not so much of what the people are. My heart hurts for those people because they are blinded, and they're, they're, they're doing something ignorantly as they watch, their, as they follow and sue after their leaders. That's the scary thing. I believe it's one of the reasons James writes in chapter 3, the book of James, let not many of you become teachers lest you incur a harsher judgment. Because as a teacher, it's my job to know the scriptures. That as I lead you, I lead you according to the word of God. So if I'm going to make myself a teacher and just dismiss the word of God, and we're just going to go with the fills, what happens if I put you in a position to make you fall? Or what, if, what happens if I put you in a position of false security? And I say because I've taught you to speak in tongues, you're born again, even though you've never really bowed the knee to Christ. And you go to hell with the false security that, well, I should have went to heaven because I spoke in tongues. Can you imagine how that person is going to stand before God on judgment day? I don't even want to know. It's on the teacher, it's on the pastor to know the word of God. That's why it's our job to study the word, that as we bring it to you, as we teach you, to edify you, that we would know how to serve God accordingly. That's the anger that stirs up in me, is that. But again, that flaw in humanity, that flaw that if you don't share my gift or if you don't share my conviction, then you must not be born again. Did you know I used to think like that? I used to think like if everybody didn't have my conviction, then you weren't right with God. God gave me certain convictions in my young years as a Christian, and I really believe that everybody has to have this conviction. If God gave it to me, then he must have given it to everybody. And if you don't share my conviction, then shame on you. And shame on me because I was so wrong. God did not, your convictions, your convictions, your, the things that God implants in your heart aren't the same things that God has put in my heart. Now, we're, we might cross paths with similarities in convictions, but there's things that are going to be wrong for you that are, aren't wrong for me. And there's going to be things that are wrong for me that aren't wrong for you. And there's going to be convictions that God puts on you guys that he doesn't put on me. And it's okay, but that's how the body operates, right? The body is supposed to be different. As a matter of fact, going forth, Paul is going to set this principle in motion. That no part of the body is supposed to operate as every single other part of the body. Let's look at them in verse 15, 14. He says, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. Is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? He says, and if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I'm not a part of the body. I quit. 
Is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Can you imagine if the eye looked at the hand and said, you disgust me. You don't see how I see. Ugh, you disgusting fingers. And if the fingers looked at the foot and said, oh, you, 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 you disgusting toes. Can't believe you guys. We do all the work. We grab it. Can you imagine if the body turned on itself like that? My poor baby boy. I don't know what's going on. His toenail kind of lifted up and it was all bloody and that's what we were doing before service started, trying to cut it off. And so I don't know if that's why he's crying, but my heart's all hurting. <laughs> you know, but can you imagine if the body reacted to itself like that? But it doesn't, does it? The hand doesn't worry about what the foot's doing. The foot has its own job. The foot doesn't worry about what the nose is doing. The nose has its own job. The mouth has its job. The ears have their job. The eyes have our job. The veins have their own job. Can you imagine if your venal system just decided, I'm going to be a toenail. I'm tired of, you know, pushing blood throughout your body. I just want to relax on the foot for a while. You would die. <laughs> we laugh because it's, there, there's humor in that. It's funny when we think about it, right? But that's how the body operates. My, the, my teeth don't worry about what my tongue does because my teeth have their own job. And my hand doesn't worry about what my foot does because they each have their own job. My heart doesn't worry about my brain. My brain doesn't worry about my eyes. My eyes don't worry about my skin. My, they all do their own job and my body operates full functioning and it does what it's supposed to do. So if I'm sitting here worried about one of you guys and why you're not like me, Realize we're pushing against the grain of the creation of the body. We're pushing against the grain of the body of Christ more in particularly. Jesus may not have called you to be a teacher. And if I try to make you a teacher like me, I'm going to do several things. One, I'm going to put you in a position to go against God. Because if God hasn't called you to be it, and I, I push you to be in such a position, I put you in the seat of judgment. Not only that, if God hasn't gifted you to do that, I'm going to put you in the position to make other people stumble. So then what should Trish be doing? Trish should be doing what God has called Trish to do. And if Trish isn't called to be a mouthpiece, then she shouldn't be a mouthpiece. If God has called her to be a hands, then she needs to be hands. And if I'm not called to be hands, I shouldn't be trying to operate like hands. I should be a mouthpiece. But one of the flaws in humanity is if you don't operate according to my convictions and my truths, then there must be something wrong with you. And that's so far from the truth. So far from the truth. The body has its members and each part of the body, unique in its role and functionality, operates as it's supposed to. In verse 18 he says, or my, verse 18, but now God has placed the members, each of them, in the body just as he desired. Do you realize that you are where you are in the body of Christ because God has desired you to be there? Do you know that? God wanted you to be what you are. He wanted you to have the gift you had. And he equipped and endowed you with that and power with the Holy Spirit in that gift. Did you know that when you don't feel the power of the Spirit moving, it's because you're not operating in the gift that he set before you? Do you know that? I'm serious. I'm dead serious. I've done it. I did it for years. I just went against the flow of what I knew God called me to do. And I just felt so far from him. I felt like his power was never present in me. And it was horrible. It was rough. And I just didn't want to be a teacher. I did not want to go be, I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to take this route. I mean, some of you know, I wanted to rap. I wanted to make music. And the, wor the further I, I pushed against the grain, the worse my music became, the worse my temperament became, the worse, I mean, I just became all out of whack. And the power of God just wasn't with me the way he used to be. And it wasn't until I gave up my desires and operated in what God called me to be that once again, the power of the Spirit of God moved with me, moved in me. Again, something as simple as, and not, it's not that it's simple, we just think of it as simple because we're stupid in our humanity and in our flesh. So we categorize things from good, from best to least or from best to worst or greatest to small, however we do it. 
But we think of something as simple as hospitality, but then we look at this fellowship and this is a product of Trish's hospitality. What seems so minute up front ends up being this powerhouse of a gift in the long run. And in her mind, she probably thinks, well, I, all I did was open my home. <clears throat> Opening your home is what brought this. It's what brought these people. How many people weren't going to a church that now have a home that watch online? I get people watching online often that you know, ask me, don't stop teaching. We watch, we watch, we watch. God is using you. Please keep, keep doing it. Please. From something so simple as just opening a home. And in your mind, you probably don't feel like you did much, do you? That's usually how that gift works. You just, you're, when you operate in the gift, you're like, I don't see the big deal. And everybody else is like, dude, God is working through you. Keep doing it. Keep allowing, keep allowing him to use you in those manners. You can't just decide to not be a part of the body because you don't want to be a part of the body. There was a kid, and he threw a fit, like kids do. I'm going to probably experience it here with my son soon. And this little kid was stomping around in his living room, angry at his mom and dad, saying, I'm not part of this family anymore. I don't want to be in this family. I'm not your son. You guys are mean. I don't want to be in this family. And he's just angry. And the mom and dad just, oh, we're not going to, we're not going to argue with you. And a little bit of time goes by and the kid calms down and he starts crying and he's apologizing. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Mom. I, I don't, I didn't mean what I said. I really want to be a part of this family. I, please don't kick me out. I love you guys. And, and the dad pulls him in and he hugs him and he says, Son, you could not be a part of this. You could not never be a part of this family if you wanted to, ever. Double negative makes the part. You will always be a part of this family, son. Never could you not. You will always be because of your DNA. You see, son, your mom and I, our blood courses through your veins. You're a part of this family whether you like it or not. And that's how the body is. That's how the body of Christ is. You're an ear, not because you want to be an ear. You're an ear because God made you an ear. And in the DNA works of the body of Christ, that's what you are. You can stomp around and pretend, I want to be a mouth, I want to be... Just stop, stop, calm down. Go back to dad, say sorry for acting a fool, dad. And that'll put you right back where you belong. Be the ear that God has made you to be. And watch God use you as an ear. But I don't want to be an ear. The ear doesn't shine. Well, go be a liver then if God has called you to be a liver. I don't want to be a liver. Did you know the body can't function without the liver? It's useless without a liver. There's nothing wrong with being one of the parts of the body that isn't flashed on the stage. I'm telling you, this isn't as flashy as it seems, you guys. You guys, you know, a lot of people look at the pastor on stage the one or two hours a week and think, oh, how glorious. But they don't see the rest of the week on the battles and the, the studying and the constant, I mean, the enemy constantly getting at you. And they just see the one or two hour when they're up there and the gift is shining. They don't see the rest of the, the, the turmoil that comes with being a teacher or a pastor. It's not a walk through the park. It's not rosy. It's, I believe, one of the reasons that James says, let not many of you do this. It's a hard work. It's tough. And I'd never encourage anybody to do this unless God has called them specifically and made known that call. If the desire to be a pastor or teacher is because I like the idea of being a pastor or teacher, I would say you're probably not equipped for it. It has to be an undeniable call. The whole woe is me if I do not do this. Well, what is my gift? I don't know what my gift is then. Sit in the body of Christ, serve where you see a need, and watch God show you your gift. That's usually how he shows you what your gift is. He will put something in you. He'll let you see something that nobody else sees. He'll put something on your heart, and what you'll usually do is you'll come tell me about it. And I'll say, cool, I agree. Now do something about it. God didn't show me. He showed you. God allowed you to see something I'm not seeing. Therefore, you take care of that. Look at the trash. I, the trash is always full. I didn't notice. Well, maybe God has put it on your heart to go throw that trash. Maybe God is giving you a gift of helps. I can't do it all. I try to run the sound, the light, and teach, and get the, the camera ready, and the, cry, and the coffee. and the... I'm just one person. I'm not called to do all this other stuff. 
I do it because there's nobody else to do it. I'm called to teach the word of God. That's what I'm called to do. I will do these things because there's nobody else to do them. That's fine. It's not a big deal. I'm praying and believing God will bring people in and raise them up. When you see a need and God puts a need on your heart and presses something that needs to be done, you operate in that. Because God has shown you something that he hasn't shown anybody else. And usually if you saw it, God is going to equip you with a gift to operate in it. So what is your gift? What is God showing you? And whatever he's showing you, go do something about it. And watch God work. It's, he's incredible like that. Verse 19. If they were all one member, I'm going to go back to verse 18. Or verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole, if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much sure that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. The ones that seem to be weaker are necessary. When we think of weaker, think of the one that's not on display. Again, everybody wants to be a mouth. Everybody wants to be you know, the worship leader, the guitar, the the. the, the the person that's seen, and we feel like if we're not in a position where we're seen, then we're not necessary. Well, if you just clean the bathrooms and nobody sees you clean the bathroom, well, then you're just not really that important to the body of Christ. Now, the question is, do you clean the bathrooms for the church or do you clean the bathrooms for the Lord? If you clean the bathrooms for the church, then I mean, well, thank you. I appreciate that for sure. But, but if you clean the bathrooms because God has put it on your heart to clean the bathrooms, then realize that that's a great calling to have. Do you realize that the importance isn't about what you do, but it's about being faithful to what God has given you? Imagine that. It's not about what you do, but it's about being faithful in what God has set before you. We all want to do this. We all want to be seen. Not everybody, but typically people want to be in a position where they're seen. The truth is, if you, if you can't be faithful in something small that God gives you, you would never be faithful in something like this. Do you know how demanding this job is? How many hours I spend studying a week? Do you know how many hours I spend talking to people? And that's not including my job that I actually work. And that's not including my wife and then my son and then my two stepkids and then I have dogs that I have to take care of and my cat. We have dishes to wash. We have clothes to fold. It's tiring, it's exhausting. It's very exhausting, actually. It's, ah. And if God, but if God hasn't equipped you, you'll never be able to do it. If I, if, I, if I wasn't faithful in the little things in my earlier years as a Christian, do you think God could have trusted me with this? Absolutely not. Jesus said it like this. He who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. What has God called you to do? Be faithful with that. Don't think that because you're a finger that you're not important to the body. Has anybody in here lost a finger ever? Had it sewn back on or something? Toe? Has anybody lost any kind of an appendage? No, well, you never lost one. So if we think if I lost my pinky, it probably wouldn't be that bad because it's just a pinky. But I'll bet you that not having that pinky would be horrible. Let's use the big toe, for example. It's just one of nine. One of nine toes. What's the deal if you lose a big toe? You realize you'd have to learn how to walk again? Because that big toe is a central point of your balance. No big toe, I mean, yeah. I mean, in my mind, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you think the other four toes would support you just fine, but they wouldn't. Because that big toe is an important part of that foot of your body in order for your balance to be adequate. Again, I don't know exactly what the purpose of a pinky is, but I wonder, it'd probably be hor horrible to lose this. I've told you guys this story, I'll tell you again. I used to drive a little Ford Focus, and one time my driver's side mirror broke up. And I didn't think it was that big of a deal because it was just a rear view mirror. It's not a big deal, like whatever. And throughout the week as I drove my car, I realized I could not see anything to the left of me. I tried to turn, there's blind spots. I tried to look through my, my, my rear view here, nothing. I'm like, oh my goodness. 
I need that mirror back. And so I made it essential to get that mirror put back on. Cool. Three days later or so, my driver's side mirror gets knocked off. I got this mirror. This is the more important mirror. I got the rear view. You know, I can turn my shoulder. I can see just fine. That mirror is not as essential because I, I was broke at the time. I didn't have money to be buying mirrors and putting them back on. So I left it alone for a few days. I'm, I don't need the mirror. Well, it turns out that it was really hard to see everything on the right side of me now. And I mean, almost caused a couple wrecks. And I realized, oh my word, that mirror is really important too. So I made it an essential point to get that mirror fixed. Excellent. <laughs> and this is just the humor of God. as probably for a study like this. And then I was, you know, if you guys know where Real Grand and I-40 is, there's that little gas station right there. Well, they used to have a big hole, a huge pothole, when you drove into it that I didn't see at the time. And my car, boop, boop, boop. And my rear view mirror fell off. And this is all within three weeks. And I really thought the rear view, okay, I can see from kind of behind and the sides of me, I don't need that mirror. It's not essential. Threw it to the side. Again, I didn't have money to fix that mirror. And one or two days goes by and I realize I really need that mirror because I, I don't know what's going on behind. It, I realize those three mirrors aren't just there for pretty. Those three there's, mirrors are there for the purpose of the car being able to do and get you to where you need to be safely and they're essential. It's probably how the pinky is. We probably don't think there's much with the pinky. Go chop it off and come back in a year and tell me if life is easier without the pinky. Don't do that, please. Disclaimer, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna sue you, Pastor. You told me to chop off my finger. Don't do that. The point is, we don't de I didn't I didn't deem those mirrors very essential until I didn't have them. And then I realized how essential they really were and how important they were to the safety of my driving. We think of these members that seem less important, we deem them to be less. And truly, they're, they're more essential. I think of your heart. Who in here has seen your own heart? None of us. But remove that heart and you'll die. Who here has seen your liver? None of us. The liver isn't something that we glorify. But you remove that liver and you'll die. Who here has seen your brain? None of us. Now, there are some people who, it seems like they don't have brains. But... The truth is, they do, because if you didn't have a brain, you would die. They're essential. You don't see them, but they're essential. What are the things we place value on? I say, oh, you have a pretty face. Look at your eyes, they're so pretty. Oh, you have a nice nose. You have a beautiful figure. We, we, we place value on the things that are readily seen. But those aren't the real valuable parts of that person's body. Even on a spiritual scale, the heart's more important than the, the physical appearance, right? I mean, you can be with somebody who's really pretty and it drives you insane. And then you can be with somebody who may not be pretty to the world standards, but they're beautiful on the inside, and the more beautiful their inside is, you just fall in love with them. The value isn't always on what's readily seen. Don't think the worship leader, or the pastor, or the so-and-so, that we're the heart of the church, because we're not. I mean, there's only a church because you guys show up. I could be the greatest teacher in the world, but if I come teach to an empty room, what, <laughs> what is it? Nothing. Without the rest of the body here, it's just I'm preaching to an empty room. She's the greatest teacher in the world, Pastor. Yeah, but if nobody's there to hear, if there's not a body to accompany the work of the mouth going out, then there's nothing. If the body's not whole, then that's it. The body's not whole. It's necessary that the body be whole. Each part is important. Each part is necessary. It's essential. Verse 24, he says, I'm going to read verse 23 again. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And less presentable members become much more presentable. Verse 24, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body by giving it the more abundant honor to the member which lacked. Again, it's kind of what we just talked about. How the, the things that seem less important really hold more value in the body than we give credit to. 25, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So don't 
devalue yourself by saying, well, my gift's not important. My place in the body of Christ is not important. Your place is exactly where you should be and where you need to be. And God has placed you there for purpose. Don't devalue yourself. Would anybody in here be so bold as to say God got it wrong? Raise your hand if you're that bold. I'm glad I'm talking to a smart group of people. Because if you have the audacity to say God got it wrong, that's a stupid mistake. I'll tell you that much. So to say that my place in the body has no value is essentially to say God got it wrong. Because if God has desired and willed you to be where you are, then be there. And allow yourself to operate in the spirit there. But I don't think it's that important. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters that God put you there. Just be faithful. Be faithful. You know, can everybody in here agree that they've never been to a perfect church? Right? I mean, there will never be a perfect church. But there's better churches and there's worse churches. There just is. There's churches that we like more and there's churches that are like, ah, I'm not feeling that place. Did you know the churches that we really like and esteem higher are the churches that operate in all ends of the gifts? That everybody knows their place and they operate where they're supposed to operate. And when the body operates the way it was meant to operate, it is smooth. And when the body has disruptions in it, the whole body fills it. That's what Paul just said. If one member suffers, it all suffers. Has anybody in here ever broken an arm? You remember how hard it was to readjust to life with that broken bone? I broke my wrist once, and I remember, turns out there's all kinds of stuff I couldn't do. I didn't know that. It was horrible. Six weeks of just garbage. And I was like, I couldn't ride my bike. I mean, I couldn't play basketball. I couldn't go swimming, and it was summer. I mean, I couldn't use my left hand for all kinds of stuff, and I never realized how important that left hand was. I just never used it, because I just thought my right hand is all I really needed. My whole body suffered because of this one broken bone here in my wrist. So when one member suffers, it all suffers. The whole body suffers. And when one member is praised, the whole body is praised. The whole body is praised because the whole body works together for the accomplishment of whatever took place to bring that praise. Therefore, the whole body rejoices in it because it is a collective doing. It's weird, huh, how this chapter is not really about the gifts. <laughs> you know, it's just not. It really is about the unity of the believer. It's about the unity of the body. We are the body of Christ. Verse 27, he says, now you are Christ's body. That is what you are. That is part of who you are. You are his body. Again, verse 27, you are the body. You are Christ's body. And individually, members of it. Now, listen to what he's going to do. This is why we associate this chapter with the gifts. He says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. So he lists these gifts not to say that the gifts are the object of this chapter, but to list that the gifts are representative of parts of the body of Christ. The same way the hand works and operates for the body is the same way the gift of teaching or the gift of healing works in the body of Christ. The same way the mouth works for our physical body is the same way the gift of teaching works and operates in the body of Christ. The same way that the gift of, I don't know, the, the, the way the legs work for operating in your body is the same way that administrations, you get what I'm saying, right guys? You're picking up what I'm putting down, yes? It's not so much the gift, but it's more about the body working in unity. Again, we're all individually members of it, and God has appointed each in this. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, and administrations, and various kinds of tongues. 29, not, are not all apostles, are they? All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? And, and, and these are very rhetorical questions. The answer is no, not all do. Why? Because the mouth isn't the ears, the ears aren't the eyes, the eyes aren't the nose, the nose isn't the tongue, the tongue isn't the feet, the feet aren't the hands. 
All can't be fingers, can they? No. All can't be eyes, can they? No. And so all don't have all gifts. Trish, you don't have all the gifts. Rita, you don't have all the... None of us have all the gifts. Some of us have multiple gifts, and that's good. It's not bad to have multiple gifts. But we all have certain gifts. And the gifts are meant to bring the body together in unity for the edifying of the church. That is the purpose of these gifts. One gift, again, doesn't make you more in Christ, and another gift doesn't make you less in Christ. We are one body in Christ. If you ever come across one of those believers who takes the stance that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved, I'm going to encourage you, don't fight with them. Don't even argue with them. Just show them what the scripture says. Bring them here. Show them here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30. All do not speak in tongues, do they? No, they don't. And, you know, leave that there. Don't argue over it. Don't fight over it. It's not worth dividing over. If they want to continue to believe that, pray for them. You don't, tell, don't tell them you're going to pray for them. Just pray for them. Bring unity rather than discord. You know, maybe they're just not there yet. Maybe they're just not mature yet. Maybe God is still doing a work in them. But realize not everybody is equipped with all the gifts. So if you're in here today and you don't pray in tongues, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a bad thing. If you do pray in tongues, awesome. If you ever want to pray in tongues up here, all I'd say is either God better give you the interpretation or God better give somebody in the body the gift of interpretation. Because the Bible says when the tongues are used, either you should interpret or somebody that's in the body should have the gift of interpretation to interpret it. Now, if we do that, then we'd be happy to let you come up and speak in a tongue and let God edify the body. That'd be great. And as long as the message is in accord with how the Bible says tongues are operated, that they always give praise to God. It always lifts up the name of the Lord. It's never some like specific message like, Trish, cut your bangs this way from now on from the Lord. And it was, you know, that's totally facetious, but the message of tongues isn't to give personal direction in that would be a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom where God speaks something directly in our life. But tongues is meant for the praises of God. At least whenever we see them in the scripture, it's always speaking of the praises of God. Now Paul says something here in this last verse that is almost troubling. He says, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. Now, that's kind of messed up. Desire the greater gifts. Didn't Paul just get through telling us not everybody has the same gifts? The eyes aren't the nose. The nose isn't the tongue. The tongue isn't the ear. What gives, Paul? Man, what's up, bro? Why, how are you going to throw us under the bus like this? You go and you tell us we're not all going to have tongues. We're not all going to be prophets. We're not all. And then you say desire the greater gifts. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the greater gift? What is the best gift? The best gift is the one that God has given you. That is the best gift. You desire the greater gift. What is the greater gift? Well, the greater gift for Trish is going to be hospitality. The greater gift for Walter is going to be teaching. The greater gift for some of you, I don't know all of your gifts, but whatever your gift is, that's the best gift for you. Now, when he says here, desire, where am I in verse 30? But earnestly desire, that's the Greek word, zeulo. And it's where we get the word zealous from, or to burn with zeal. And it's literally, be zealous in the greater gift. Be zealous with the gift that God has given you. And if you're zealous with the gift that God has given you, I'm just going to be the best helps that the church has ever seen, you're going to be such a blessing to the body. I'm going to be zealous and I'm going to be the best worship leader the church has ever seen. I'm going to be zealous and be the best bathroom cleaner the world has ever seen. You're going to be a blessing to that body. Be zealous in the greater gift, in the gift that God has placed in you, imparted into you, implanted in you, however you want to put that. And then Paul ends it with this, and I show you, and I show you a still more excellent way. 
Now, as we get into 13 next week, we're going to see that more excellent way. Paul is going to go into something much bigger than the gifts, and it's love. It's the fruit of the Spirit. To love. He's going to cover what love really is. We all have preconceived notions of love. We all have the um, Americanized idea of what we think love is. Next week, we're going to see what God says love is. We're going to see God tell us this, excuse me, this is love. We're going to find love isn't the feeling, that it is a verb. We're going to find love isn't what we think or feel, but it's what we do and how we act or react. And so next week, we're going to see the more excellent way, and then we'll get back into the gifts in chapter 14. Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you for this teaching. We thank you for this chapter, Lord. We pray that as we go out this week, Lord, you would show us where we may have disunity in us and that we would be unified as a body once again, Lord. We pray that you would help us to just walk in the gift that you have set before us, Lord, that we would not despise your gift, but that we would embrace it with zeal, Lord, that we would burn with joy in the gift that you have given us, Lord, and that we would be faithful with the gift that you have given us. Would you set your joy in our hearts, Lord, to just serve, to serve you, Lord, to set you above all, to not think of ourselves at all, but just to serve you with you in mind. I pray that as we go out this week that you would bless each one of the people that are here this morning, that you'd bless those watching online, that, Lord, you would cause your face to shine upon us, that you would hold us with your righteous right hand, Lord. And as we walk with you, Lord, that we would become less like us and more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.